Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone online and in the seminar room. Um, welcome to today's seminar by the Institute for Environmental Futures. I'm Heiko Balster, I'm the director. And it's my great pleasure today to have uh, three presenters. We have uh, Jamie Lorimer, who is Professor of Environmental Geography at the University of Oxford. Thank you very much for joining us today. And his research explores the histories, politics and cultures of wildlife conservation. Projects have ranged across scales and organisms from elephants to hookworms, and he is the author of Wildlife in the Anthropocene, Conservation After Nature, and as well of the probiotic planet, using life to manage life. And we also have Domenico Mangano and Marike van Roy. Um, they live and work in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and they formed in 2014 fusing Domenico's artistic career with Marike's academic background in political history of the built environment. And their work is characterized by a combination of research and artistic practice, which includes film, sculptural installations, participatory performances and publications. And with that, I want to hand over to you. Um, Jamie, I think you're beginning with the presentation, no? Um, sorry, Domenico and Marike, you're beginning. Over to you. We can hear you very clearly in the seminar room. Okay. Thank you very much for this invitation. Um, we want to show uh, firstly a film because actually uh, that's the reason why we were invited to this uh, seminar. Um, the film is called uh, Oysters for Naturalization. Um, it takes 12 minutes and we will uh, explain afterwards. And the first seconds are totally uh, black, and don't worry, uh, the film will uh, start afterwards straight away. Only a few have been granted the right to see us and to take us away at the rare moments when we rise above the water. Once born, we roam the ocean without our parents, sinking after a few weeks and settling in one spot which we will never abandon. We crawl over one another. If our numbers increase, we are compelled to stand up. Others on and around us are shellfish, lively slippery creatures and other ocean flotsam worm their way between us and attach themselves. 
claiming our exteriors. Your former friends, the Dutch blue mussels, are increasingly overgrowing you without asking. What do you do? A. Nothing. Just try to ignore it. B. Maneuver yourself into a position that prevents them from latching on. C. Ask the razor to negotiate for you. You are attacked by birds that try to open your shell in order to eat you. What should you do? A. Keep your shell tightly closed. B. Spit at the birds when their beaks come close. C. Pretend to be dead. Because of pollution, there's less plankton to go around among the deep sea residents. How do you respond? A. Start a discussion with the other species about fair distribution. B. Abandon your family to go and search for food elsewhere. C. Oppress the other species. We've heard that they think there are too many of us. They say that we aren't from here, that we've taken over, that the birds can't eat us and that's why they're leaving. But what does it mean to be from here? Our ancestors came from far away, but we've been rooted here for decades without ever leaving. We begin as male, but then we become female, and after that, we switch back and forth at will. Not so long ago, we were brutally disturbed by iron monsters. Forces that heaved up and down against our beds before being sucked deeper into the depths. Things dropped down upon us that we could not identify, but that impeded us. Slippery thing one is digging in the silt underneath you while you're trying to rest. What do you tell him? A. Nothing. Just fill his tunnel with poo in the hope that he will give up and go away. B. Ask him to carry out his excavations at another time. C. Nothing. Slippery things are so stupid, there's no point talking to them. The government introduces local species, which ruled here a long time ago, into your habitat. What do you do? A. Conspire with family members to bring them down. B. Nothing. They have a right to come back. C. Show them who's in charge.
legal proceedings are underway to give more humans the right to come here for harvesting. This will result in your death. What do you do about it? A. Post a notice of objection and a bottle address to the state. B. Poison yourselves in the hope that you will cease to be desirable for harvesting in the long term. C. Nothing. Everyone has a right to economic survival in this country. They've brought what they call the local residents of bygone days back to these waters. These members of the species have apparently settled some distance away, dumped by the thousands into the sea, hoping to establish a colony of their own. They say they taste like us, but look different. If they come this way, I don't know what we'll do. Maybe we'll hit it off. The other species in your surroundings don't think you should be able to change gender at will. They want you to choose one sex. What do you do? A. Make them clear why you are the way you are. B. Stick to one sex from now on. C. Keep it a secret that you're able to change gender. Okay, so this was the film. Um, the film is originally was commissioned by uh, the National Gallery in uh, Rome, and uh, we showed it there in the context of a group exhibition. Um, the film was uh, made in 2019 uh, in the north 
uh, of the Netherlands at the uh, Wadden Sea, where you have uh, several small islands. Um, and they are surrounded by uh, these oyster beds uh, that you can see in, in the movie. Um, they depend on uh, ebb and flow. Um, so several days, uh, several moments a day they come up, but we've been filming in uh, winter time uh, with uh, minus six degrees. Uh, and then they are only there uh, during the day, uh, a day, once, uh, once a day. Um, you have to go there with a huge boat, get on a small boat with all the camera equipment, uh, and then we could uh, shoot there. Um, why we've chosen this location? Um, it, the film is about uh, oysters, but they are Japanese uh, oysters. Um, and they have been introduced in uh, mid-60s uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, there was a low season for uh, the Dutch oysters, which actually are the Atlantic oysters. Uh, and the fishermen, uh, they introduced the Japanese oyster only for one season. Uh, but then, because they thought they would not survive in the Dutch waters, but then they uh, remained and uh, they've taken over. So there's hardly any uh, Atlantic oysters anymore in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but what you can see from the movie, it's not only about uh, oysters. We've used it actually as a metaphor for uh, Dutch, uh, for the immigration, um, which happened at the same time in the Netherlands. Um, the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, there was this economic immigration, um, an idea of the Dutch government, and they uh, asked um, people from Turkey and Morocco to come uh, and work in the Netherlands because there was a lack of uh, yeah, workers. Um, and also uh, when that happened, the government thought that um, the immigrants would stay only for uh, a couple of years in the Netherlands and that they would go back to uh, their home country. Um, but yeah. of course that uh, didn't happen. Um, so we saw this analogy between these uh, two moments. Uh, and we've made um, a questionnaire for the Japanese oysters uh, based on uh, the real questionnaire uh, that people who want to get Dutch citizenship uh, have to uh, fill in. Um, of course, there's different parts in these uh, exams uh, for naturalization, but a part is on how uh, Dutch customs uh, work. Um, and then you get questionnaires about how you should behave as a typical uh, Dutch person. Um, I can give two examples uh, which are taken from the original exam uh, from uh, 2019. Um, this is the first one. Hanna and Jan have new neighbors. They are called Peter and Sue. Peter and Sue are not married. Hanna thinks this is strange. What can Hannah do best? A, stop talking to Peter and Sue. B, don't show any of her feelings to Peter and Sue. C, tell Peter and Sue what she thinks. And another example. Bob and Mika are Catholic. They put a statue of Virgin Mary in their garden. What can Ali do best? A, remove the statue in the evening. B, nothing. The neighbors can decide this for themselves. C, ask the neighbors to remove the statue. Um, we came across these questions because uh, there was also a moment that Domenico uh, was thinking of, of getting a Dutch citizenship. Actually, that didn't happen yet. No. Maybe yeah. because he would not pass the questionnaire. <laughs> um, because me being Dutch, I don't even know what, what the right answer would be for these questions. And it seems almost an art project, but it, it's, uh, it's really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what we did is actually we made, uh, the questionnaire for the oysters based on their characteristics. So all the questions that you, uh, see, including the one, uh, about gender, uh, they're all based on, on how oysters are are and maybe you know but oysters can change several times from gender during their life it depends on the temperature of uh, the water um, and then in between uh, you hear the 
reflections of uh, the oysters um, because of the fact that they're not uh, Dutch and that they're an invasive species. There's a lot of ideas about if they could stay there or how they change uh, biodiversity. Um, so these are all the, um, the reflections on, on it. And then um, the last detail, when we were shooting the film, uh, it was in, um, during uh, Christmas, do. Christmas holidays. And uh, the day before we were supposed to go, there was a huge accident with a container ship um was going more uh, north and he lost uh through 342 containers uh and that uh, the stuff like mattresses was, was one of uh, the big part was going to ikea so there was mattresses all over the place plastic toys and whatever um and they had to clean up the area so we had to uh postpone our shooting we had to wait three weeks because of uh, the ebb and flow um, and there's also some uh, remarks in the film uh, about this. I think this is it for now. Yep. Yes. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much for that thought-provoking film and for giving us the history of how it was made. It was really interesting. Um, I would like to get to the next presentation to Jamie first of all, and then we can have a discussion of the overall presentations, if that's all right. Right, well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and for setting up this wonderful double bill. Uh, it's a very creative bit of uh, cur curating. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I have a, a, a presentation um, which will hopefully come up now. Is that, is that good? Can we see that all right? Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about some work I've been doing off and on over the last five or six years around uh, nature recovery around uh, this idea of the Anthropocene uh, and particularly to think it through in the context of uh, beavers, uh, their reintroduction uh, and their sort of proliferation in different parts of the world. And I'll try and draw out some connections as I see them uh, between the story of beavers and perhaps the story of the Japanese oysters that we heard about uh, in, the, in the previous film. Um, but just to situate uh, the bigger story here, so a lot of my work is interested in this idea of the Anthropocene, which most of you will be familiar with. This idea um, put forward by Earth system scientists and geologists that we need to think of the planet as moving into a different uh, state, a different geological epoch by virtue of the magnitude of, uh, of human impacts upon the planetary system. This claim uh, that the human imprint on the global environment has become so large and active that it rivals some of the great forces of nature in its impact on the functioning of the Earth system. Uh, and for many, this isn't uh, a cause for celebration. This is a cause for alarm. Uh, there's a sense in the time series sketched on this diagram here where the Earth is rolling towards us, um, that the Earth is tending towards hothouse Earth, this condition in the bottom right of that figure on the left. Uh, and uh, there's a need for us to take control of the planetary system uh, to bring the Earth out of that threshold or prevent it crossing that threshold uh, to stabilize the Earth and uh, to put it in a position of planetary stability. Um, looking at the figure on the right there, a sense that the Earth is at a threshold, a tipping point of tipping out of the long run glacial interglacial cycles that have you know, come to configure um, you know, much of, of, of what we have around us uh, now and that we might shoot off into this hothouse Earth, uh, this kind of un unprecedented or at least you know not for, for, for millions of years uh, climatic conditions. Uh, so a sense of the earth po poised at a point of crisis caused by, by human activities uh, and a sense if you like of a kind of zeitgeist of environmentalism in which we and the we there is you know is, is problematic but we are the first generation with the knowledge of how our activities influence the earth system and thus the first generation with the power and the responsibility to change our relationship with the planet. So this again is Will Stefan and others associated with the Anthropocene and associated with this, I guess, rise of Earth system science and a particular way of thinking about the planet as threatened, um, but also potentially uh, within the bounds of human control, within the bounds of, of knowing and mapping and modeling and subject to intervention uh, that might anticipate a set of geoengineering interventions or other ways of, of managing a planet. And this gives rise to different responses. 
one being a kind of techno-optimist uh, version of what's called eco-modernism, an idea that with more science and more tech and better government, we could achieve our enlightenment destiny as the god species, uh, in the words of Mark Linus, uh, and we um, can uh, you know, fully domesticate the planet and deliver a good Anthropocene. That's not the version that I'm subscribing to here. I'm more interested in a, in a slight modification to that, which is coming to prominence in the world of nature recovery and in environmentalism at large, which talks about the possibility of nature-based solutions to environmental crises. Uh, some of you will have come across the rise of nature-based solutions. We hear about nature-based approaches to carbon dioxide removal. These are ways of modifying ecological systems, modifying um, the circulation of elements within the planetary system such that we might hit net zero without some of the hard engineering solutions associated with geoengineering. So I guess famously planting lots of trees, thinking about soil carbon sequestration, thinking about modifying the chemistry of the oceans so that we could draw down carbon from, from the atmosphere. Uh, and I'm interested uh, in the work that the word nature does here. Uh, if the oyster film was about the naturalization of oysters, I'm interested in this figure of nature, the political work done by appeals to nature uh, to set up a certain set of politics. And in thinking about politics, to think about who decides as to what is a nature-based solution uh, and who benefits from the implementation of different nature-based solutions. And so we can think about some of these questions through the lens of uh, the beaver. Uh, the beaver is, uh, comes in two species. There's a North American beaver and there's a Eurasian beaver. Uh, they're quite different from each other in evolutionary terms, um, but they do quite similar things when they're put into the landscape. Uh, so much of us think of beavers as, as animals that chew through trees, uh, and they do chew through trees, and they chew through trees uh, primarily to get access to uh, the leaves at the top of the trees uh, that they want to eat. Um, but they also chew through trees to build dams uh, and beavers build dams to moderate the flow of water uh, to have a, a stable water level so that they can make their dams and their, their dens, their beaver dens, um, such that predators can't get in to, uh, to eat, eat their young. So beavers have this incredible ability to uh, modify the water dynamics of river catchments. And this is, if you like, why um, conservationists, ecologists have become particularly interested in beavers uh, because of their ability to enact these landscape scale changes uh, to the flow of water through particular habitats. Uh, beavers are promoted as what's called a keystone species. If you think of a, a, a keystone is a, is a sort of metaphor for an arched bridge. The keystone is the, the stone that holds the whole arch together. And if you take the keystone away, the, the arch collapses. Beavers are held to be these species that have this ability to, if you like, build a whole ecosystem around them by virtue of the ecologies that they create. So here we see how beaver habitats are understood to be good for a whole range of other species uh, and, uh, and wider ecologies. And as well as being a keystone species, uh, beavers are also promoted as, as what are called ecosystem engineers. And I'll come back to that. But uh, beavers used to be common across Europe. Um, used to be spread all across uh, Eurasia, um, but uh, they went pretty much extinct in Europe or very close to extinction in Europe uh, by the end of or the early years of the 19th century. Uh, largely as a consequence of hunting and trapping. So beavers were hunted to extinction uh, or near extinction in Europe, which in some ways fueled settler colonialism into parts of Canada uh, and, and North America as the European supply of beavers dried up, so markets were created for beavers uh, in parts of, parts of North America. Um, beavers were valued for their fur, they made very good hats, uh, and also for their scent glands, uh, which were used to produce perfume. Uh, beavers also struggled to coexist in the landscapes of modern industrial agriculture, uh, in industrial forestry, there's not much place for beavers in the highly organized drainage regimes that have come to characterize much of the, uh, much of the countryside uh, in parts of Europe and in parts of North America. Uh, but from about the 1920s onwards, there were ongoing efforts to reintroduce the beavers back into Europe, initially just for the purposes of having uh, more beaver fur. Uh, so efforts were made in Russia to captive breed beavers 
um, and to uh, farm them, if you like, which turned out not to be very successful. Um, but later, beavers emerged as tools for uh, tackling flood and drought problems. So beavers get valued because of their ability to modulate the flow of water through um, uh, river systems. Uh, and so with the rise of extreme weather events associated with flooding, uh, there's been this idea that you could put beavers back into river catchments and they would complexify the drainage regimes to slow the flow of water passing through uh, a catchment and they'd help to prevent flooding. So this is a beaver being reintroduced into the Forest of Dean in the UK. Uh, that's Derek Gow in the forefront there, who's the sort of expert on beaver reintroductions in the UK. And those of you who follow British politics closely will see just behind Derek Gow in the pink shirt is Michael Gove, uh, who at that point was environment minister. Gove is a big fan of beavers, as are quite a lot of the current Tory cabinet. Uh, and there's something about beavers that appeals to a particular idea of, uh, of rewilding as it meets kind of notion of the hardworking ecological subject that will go in there uh, and, and sort out our drainage problems uh, for us. Uh, so beavers have emerged as these ecosystem engineers or nature's architect, if you like, the ideal species that you would let loose to reconfigure a landscape uh, in order to deliver uh, water uh, security. Again, we get this metaphor of beavers as a uh, keystone within this wider ecosystem, in this case in, in the US. Okay, uh, And we can connect beavers to this wider interest in rewilding that has emerged as a paradigm of, of conservation. Again, very much about using these keystone species to reset ecologies that are understood to be out of balance or kind of uh, uh, dysbiotic. Um, so the famous story being the wolves of Yellowstone, that the wolves were brought back to Yellowstone to reset the grazing dynamics of the large herbivores uh, in, in, in the National Park, uh, creating what was called an ecology of fear. Uh, by changing uh, where the uh, herbivores grazed, it radically changed the nature of the vegetation that was growing uh, in particular places. Uh, there's even a group wants to bring back the woolly mammoth uh, to put it into Siberia as a tool for uh, preventing the melting of the permafrost and preventing this big release of methane um, that is understood to, to be associated with the melting of the permafrost. So the mammoth is proposed as this tool for fighting global warming. So you have this interesting nature-based solution set of uh, issues, set of strategies here to try and tackle planetary scale or regional scale dynamics with water, carbon, methane, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what do beavers tell us about nature recovery in the Anthropocene? What do they tell us about the idea of nature as it's come to figure in ideas about nature-based solutions? So, so on the one hand, this seems like a good news story. It's great. Everyone loves beavers. They're charismatic animals. They're coming back into the landscape. Um, but it raises interesting questions about what we think nature is and what sort of politics the word nature is doing in this context. Uh, and so we can think about this along uh, three different axes. So one is a kind of ontological axis about what we think nature is. Uh, the second is a, is a story about processes and the kind of desirable processes of ecological transformation that are associated with the turn of beavers. And the third is a question of politics, if you like. Now, what are the political systems that beavers are naturalizing or could be used to challenge. And I'll just quickly touch on those. Uh, I know we've not got a huge amount of time uh, and then we can open up for questions. So we're thinking about a kind of ontology of nature for the Anthropocene. Um, a lot of rewilding initially was concerned with wilderness. You know, nature was only nature, it was untouched by human hands. Uh, but the story of the beavers gives us a very different story. It's a story about recombination. It's a story about organisms going back into landscapes that are fundamentally changed by human activities. Um, usefully conceived as anthromes, let's say, in the words of, of Earl Ellis, the, the biogeographer. Um, so beavers in some places have become very urban species. They use bits of urban infrastructure. Uh, these are some images from bits of Bavaria. Um, they're happy to sort of build with bits of modern infrastructure. They'll use litter. They'll use all sorts of bits of human detritus if necessary uh, to, to, to make a home in the city. Um, they're often there because of active human introduction and relocation. Um, they haven't always got there of their own accord, if you like, uh, sometimes deliberately and sometimes accidentally. Um, so there were big plans and efforts to introduce beavers back into parts of North America where they'd been hunted into extinction, including, uh, as Dolly Jorgensen uh, traces in her book on the history of beaver reintroduction, efforts to sort of drop beavers into national parks in boxes on parachutes 
areas where it was too hard to get to, um, they had an elaborate infrastructure for um, dropping these beavers into national parks and seemingly the beavers burst out of the boxes uh, and got on with their lives. So these are you know, very much um, beavers that are dependent on bits of human infrastructure. There's lots of people whose job it is now to catch, translocate, quarantine and move beavers around Europe to satisfy this demand uh, for beavers uh, in, in different places. There's an active movement of Scottish beavers down to England at the moment, about a thousand pounds of beaver is the going rate uh, if you want to get a beaver into your nature reserve or your large uh, country estate. Um, and there's all sorts of expertise out there now for living with beavers. So uh, Rosin uh, Campbell Palmer, who uh, is, a, is a, a key player in this beaver translocation movement, has written this wonderful handbook on uh, living with beavers, including how to build what's called a beaver deceiver here. Uh, so beavers um, actually don't have great eyesight and are very dependent on their hearing. And they work out where the water is moving through the river system by listening. And so if you want to modulate the flow uh, of a dam, you can't just pull away the branches and let the water cascade out. You have to build one of these beaver deceivers to trick the beaver that you've controlled the flow of water uh, by building an upstream cage and a downstream outfall using pipes and cages and, and all the rest. So sophisticated ways of you know, domesticating beavers or tuning into beavers to understand their needs, to make them into these functional tools for nature-based landscape solutions. So this is a, a recombinant ecology. It's an ecology that's fundamentally formed by humans, technology and animals working in various, uh, various relationships here. And a lot of this is geared around um, trying to harness the agencies of beavers to deliver what um, the anthropologist Anna Singh describes as resurgence, which is the sort of mutual flourishing, the growing back of forms of human and, and animal conviviality in particular landscapes. But it's done against a backdrop of a concern about what she describes as proliferation. So proliferation uh, and resurgence defined here as resurgence being the work of many organisms negotiating across differences to forge assemblages of multi-species livability in the midst of disturbance versus proliferation being the unmanageable spread of life forms that cause disease and pollution and threaten resurgence, the sort of threat that's understood to accompany uh, invasive species in some situations. Often foreseen due to what she calls the modular simplifications of the plantation, intensive agricultural plantations, and the networks of globalization. And we can see examples of beavers as agents of both resurgence and proliferation. Uh, so the good news story for ecologists of beavers is about the ways in which their engineering brings back uh, complexity into river systems, slows the flow, creates spaces for other organisms to thrive, shown here in this nice if you like, time series diagram from, um, uh, from the US uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So this is a sort of archetypal idea of what you want beavers to do to to enable resurgence. Um, but often beavers are coming back into landscapes that haven't had beavers in them for a long time. They come into conflict with uh, human infrastructure. They will chew through valuable trees. Beaver dams will burst and they might lead to you know, roads washing out. Often they'll come back into landscapes where they don't have predators and you know, the wolves and the coyotes and others, uh, the bears are not there to eat them. Um, so they can unsettle ecologies in the way in which they enact their transformation. But there are also situations now as a consequence of climate change when beavers are moving into systems and actually actively accelerating uh, the feedback processes that are, that are seen to, to be leading to climate change. So particularly associated here with the greening of the Arctic, which is a fast ongoing process as a consequence of climate change. What scientists studying the return of beavers back into parts of Canada and, and the USA here are seeing is that in building their ponds, beavers are massively increasing the speed at which permafrost is melting and leading to this increased release in, in, in methane from the permafrost in parts of the Arctic in that way. So the beavers are doing their thing, but because of the particular configuration of the changing dynamics of, of, of the Earth system, if you like, beavers here become agents of the acceleration of change in an undesirable fashion, rather than a kind of buffering to modulate planetary dynamics back to a, a kind of Holocene conditions that most conservationists would want. And then we see a particularly striking example of beavers as agents of proliferation down in Patagonia, so down in the bottom left of the map here, 
So beavers, uh, Canadian beavers or beavers were introduced from Canada by the Canadians as part of an economic development initiative into Patagonia um, to try in the sort of mid 19th century, uh, sorry, mid 20th century to create a kind of beaver uh, fur industry in this part of the world associated with efforts to build commercial timber uh, in this part of the world. So Laura Ogden traces this very nicely in her book on Patagonia called Loss and Wonder at World's End. And she looks at the consequences of beavers having been introduced into these landscapes and chewing through trees that have never previously encountered beavers. So there's no kind of evolutionary adapted ecology uh, that knows what to do with beavers when they arrive. And they've decimated these trees that don't grow back. So a lot of trees in Europe that get chewed by beavers have this ability to re-sprout from the base. And so they kind of you know, continue to grow. Beavers have wreaked havoc across this landscape in, in parts of Patagonia. So beavers here, out of place, out of context, become disastrous agents of proliferation rather than the sort of life-giving sources of resurgence and, and flourishing. Okay, so that's the second axis. In this case, beavers become what you know Chris Thomas describes as the inheritors of the earth, these organisms that piggyback off the networks of globalization of plantation agriculture, I guess a bit like some of the species that we saw in the films, these are the species that will inherit the earth, you know, should uh, things unravel fast in the context of the Anthropocene. Um, okay, and then the third axis to think about this, which folds in questions of political transformation, is to think about the ways in which beavers are part of transformations in socio-ecological relationships. And particularly to pick up on this lively debate in social science about the merits of resilience as a concept for thinking about uh, the nature of socio-ecological systems. People have tended to celebrate resilience, uh, but critics suggest that resilience in itself can be quite a conservative term if it's about maintaining the status quo. And a lot of work on securing resilience has often been about maintaining the status quo, maintaining capitalism, maintaining uh, unequal sets of knowledge relationships and, and relationships of power. And instead they would contrast resilience with interventions about transformation, which are trying to tip the system out of its current configuration into, into a new uh, configuration. And I can say more about that if we want to, but we can think about this in the context of beavers where by and large beavers in the UK have been used to shore up the status quo. You know, in this nice image here from uh, PBS, Beavers are your ideal, hardworking, neoliberal, middle manager subject. You know, they turn up, they work hard, they don't get paid, um, they will build their dams, they will um, you know, do, their, do their work, and they will deliver, bottom right, a whole set of forms of natural capital. You know, things that can be counted and turned into metrics uh, that can be, you know, can be a source of, of um, economic utility. In this context, beavers are often enclosed. Beavers, given the choice, will move down to the floodplain where life is easy, uh, but you don't generally want beavers on the floodplain if you're doing flood risk management, you want beavers upstream. So you have to incarcerate your beavers uh, in the headwaters to create sort of beaver labor camps, if you like. Uh, so in this case, you know, the flourishing of beavers is very much conditional on them turning up and being hard workers rather than being allowed to be citizens of the Anthropocene unindexed to their work or their delivery of, of ecological value in that. So, so a sort of cautionary tale about a certain configuration of beavers as they're being introduced. But there are other situations, for example, in Scotland where beavers were uh, reintroduced illegally and have by and large been allowed to uh, proliferate on their own terms, um, but have also then been shot by landowners when they um, threaten property interests. And the status quo at the moment is that beavers cannot be shot without a license and beavers have been given permission to proliferate across Scotland out of the Tay catchment. And now there are licenses to move them further west and into other landscapes where their citizenship, if you like, is not indexed on their hardworking ability. You know, they're there as parts of flourishing ecosystems. Uh, Cleo Wolf Erskine has this nice paper looking at beaver reintroduction in North America and drawing on indigenous ideas about the commons to think about um, how beaver reintroduction needs to think about longer histories of settler colonialism, about property, about land relations, um, picking up on a critique of the emergence of a similar model to what's shown here in a North American context. Okay. So just to conclude then, what, what do we get from thinking about beavers in the context of the Anthropocene, the context of the rise of, of nature-based solutions? So on the one hand, we get this you know, quite powerful ontology emerging of the earth as a system, a system of systems 
um, that has metabolic flows that can be mapped and modeled and ultimately made subject to various forms of nature-based intervention. You can stick a mammoth into Siberia, you can stick a beaver into the forest of Dean, and they have this leverage ability to modify metabolic flows to reset planetary dynamics. So it's a kind of planetary view, particular view of the Earth system that's poised on a threshold, but it's also a system that can be managed and, and optimized. Um, the work that nature does here is often disingenuous. You know, as, as lots of social science has argued, you know, nature masks the politics. There isn't a singular historic nature that we can refer to. These are systems fundamentally changed by people. Uh, there are multiple future natures that could emerge according to what we do with beavers. Uh, and it's really a democratic deliberative discussion exercise to work out which kind of natures will emerge rather than to hit people over the head with a big story about nature with a capital N and say, we've got to deliver this fast without due process. Um, at the same time, it's a story in which humans are not totally in control. You know, as we saw in Patagonia, beavers let loose. And I guess, as we see with the oysters in the film, uh, are out with human control. So this isn't a story of humans as the god species. There's a story of unruly forces that humans are only partly uh, in, in charge of uh, in these circumstances. Okay, and I will stop there. Uh, let me stop my uh, sharing. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very, very much to our, both our speakers. Um, let's give them a round of applause. It was absolutely fascinating and uh, you wouldn't have heard that there were quite a few laughs in the room from both the film and some of the things you said, Jamie. So uh, yeah, a really interesting take. Um, we're going to open up for questions now. Um, Heiko's had to dash off to another commitment, so um, I'm going to be chairing this, um, this small session before we finish at three. So do we have any questions from the room I can put to either of our groups of speakers? I've checked online and our online audience don't have any at the moment, so... Emilio. Um, yeah, I do have a question that I think that links both of the parts of the seminar. Can we consider uh, beavers natural or naturalized when they're reintroducing those areas where they used to be? They're not being there anymore for some time, some a different habitat or different habitats, I'll like simplified or more undesirable for humans have a goal. And after that, even more, taking into account in the map that you show, there are two species, castor canadiense and castor fever. Would we consider in the areas that have been historically uh, inhabited by castor canadiense, uh, sorry, castor fever, natural, the role that castor canadiense has taken? Uh, do you need that repeated or did you, were you able to hear that over the audio? Uh, I think I got most of that, uh, and I can certainly ask answer for beavers. And I guess you know similar questions apply for oysters, if you like, in terms of what you know what they do and how useful nature is as a as a descriptor. Um, I mean, I'm very wary of using it, certainly in the singular form. You know, this is more natural than that. Ecologists do give us lots of other criteria for thinking about how you might evaluate the relative merits of this species here or that species there, whether that's about biodiversity, whether that's abundance, whether that's functionality, whether that's about social justice. And, and for me, those are the criteria we might want to look at if we're thinking about, you know, should these oysters be here or those oysters not be there, rather than there was some wonderful point in the past to which everything was harmonious and everything was sort of set in stone and we've got to get back there, you know, because A, there's always lots of points in the past and B, we're not, we're not going back there again. Um, what that means specifically in local situations is always a specific local question, I think. But those are perhaps some general principles that you might want to think about if you didn't have nature as your kind of thing to hit someone over the head with. That's, thank you, Jamie. Uh, do we have any other questions uh, in the room? Uh, sorry, yes. I'm curious about the ethical process of decision makers even consider this when we introduce some viewers. And kind of when a beaver stops being an animal and becomes more of a tool that we can use clearly when they are in a physical area, so we assume that that's a good way to use it. And if that is kind of talked about in ethics, so, and 
So I'll just repeat the question uh, for you. So, um, so the, the, the questioner asks about the ethics um, associated with reintroducing beavers and at what point do beavers just become another tool of humans uh, to sort of fix problems in an area. Um, and also particularly when they're enclosed, um, sort of it becomes something of a zoo type environment. So uh, Jamie, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really important question and it's a bigger question for rewilders in, in general. You know, at what point the individual welfare is subservient to the welfare of the collective, the species or the ecology. The mortality of translocated beavers is quite high. They do die quite often. Either they get ill or they get you know, run over. Um, at the moment, they're largely seen as a sort of form of livestock, I'd say, you know, that the sort of basic welfare requirements need to be met. Um, but ultimately they're sort of being put out there to do a job, you know, and it's not about metabolizing grass into protein, it's about metabolizing trees into dams, but that seems to be the kind of version. Um, there's not as much animal welfare agitation as there is about, you know, concentrated animal feeding operations. You know, beavers generally have quite a lot of space and they're able to express quite a lot of natural behavior. Um, so, but yes, you know, there's, there's, I guess, different ethical registers you could think about it through. The status quo seems to be a bit like a kind of free range cow, seems to be that's the model that's applied to them. Thank you. Uh, any further questions before? Oh, yes. Can you hear me from here? Uh, Jamie, can you? Yes, we're getting your thumbs up. And just a point about both papers, really, which is striking to me um, the question of agency came up. So when I watched this clip, uh, which I didn't know before, it was very striking that I assume it was about the oyster's agency. So seeing from the oyster's point of view, and it turned out to be a really striking parallelism between naturalization and assimilation. So I wonder, uh, you know, what we make of this, whether agency and naturalist or materialist approach was an important aspect of your work. And then, kind of more broadly, uh, from the second speaker, the point about um, agency as one of the overarching uh, theme in the debate of the Anthropocene, as you touched on the conclusion you were talking about the emergency of planetary view uh, of a system that can be managed. And I just wanted to ask you whether you think the agency underlying this assumption is, yeah, one of the overriding topics. Yeah, I think I got about two thirds of that. Let me have a go and see if I can answer it. So a question about agency in the context of the Anthropocene, and I guess specifically about the relative significance of human agency versus non-human agency is normally what's spoken in those questions. Um, I mean, the Anthropocene story is definitely one that challenges the hubris of the kind of modern idea of human agency, the god species, humans in control. Um, and there's a version of it that you'd get from Anna Singh or Nigel Clark, which is, you know, we need to live in the ruins. We need to move to what is a kind of configured as an ontopolitics rather than a biopolitics. It's about coping with the catastrophe that's coming towards us rather than holding on to these kind of pipe dreams of, of control. Um, you know, the nature-based solutions folk are saying, hold on, you know, we're not quite there yet. We still have scope to think about the possibilities of human agency, um, but against a sort of threshold that's coming towards us very fast. Um, I sit on the fence, I guess, as to how, you know, I want to be optimistic. I want to believe that, you know, there is still possibility um, that we could stay within those thresholds. Um, but, you know, every year that passes, you become more concerned. Um, I don't want to monopolize the questions. I want I want to hear more about oysters and particularly about the sort of the fisheries side of it or the eating of them. I mean, is this still a kind of mode of interaction that persists in that there are Dutch people who go out and have a kind of a sense that the, these oysters taste differently or, or is that, did that just fail as a sort of intervention? Um, no, the Japanese oysters are uh, definitely used for the the market the market restaurants um there is uh, in this area where we've been shooting um like a division there are only two uh, fisher mongers do i say right yeah who have the right to uh, catch to catch them mm. and so there's um limits on it um but i think i didn't say before that there are now um experiments with reintroducing the dutch oyster the atlantic oyster uh, mm. And that worked. So there is this idea of that that oyster should get back into the waters. 
uh, although it's a knowledge that the Japanese oyster doesn't, I mean, it, it does, it has changed, of course, uh, biodiversity. Um, the biggest problems are for the bird, which is called, actually in Dutch, it's school exter, but in English, the translation is oyster catcher. So there's a logic. And that bird has difficulties with uh, the, the Japanese one. Um, I wanted to go back to, to, to this issue about what is real nature and how far can you go back in, in changing something which was there before or not, and who has the right to decide that. I thought, actually, when you, when you make the analogy with immigrants, then suddenly things become much more clear. Like, uh, if you take it so literal, what you could do or what you could not do. Uh, of course, I don't know, there are, of course, the populist right wing who would say we have to go back so the immigrants have to leave. Uh, and the other ones say, no, people are here now, you cannot do that anymore. But that, that, yeah, that analogy, you can need yeah. analogy so strong also with, with the beavers. Imagine if you put people in this little box with a parachute and you just drop them somewhere. Some people would be happy with that solution. But. And, yeah, other very rich. and they, they really bleed into each other, don't they? So much, you know, I mean, certainly in, you know, English, the idea of nation and nature and native, those three words are etymologically so entangled together. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so much, particularly on the right, you know, and with all sorts of problematic histories in, in Europe in, in that way. Um, but if you think of, you know, the last 12,000 years of Europe, I mean, certainly the UK was under, you know, where I am in Oxford, we had nearly a mile of ice above us, pretty much. I mean, there was nothing here. You know, everybody moved here, you know, across the sea, yeah, yeah, yeah. came here, and, you know, the same in the Netherlands, I guess. So your time period becomes really significant in terms of thinking, you know, who, who belongs where, you know, who's moving at different speeds. You know, you want a kind of a coherent ecological unit to move, perhaps, but then, you know, things would have also had. Uh, vectors of movement on birds that were networked historically and so yeah the more I read about biogeography the less the idea of the nation state as a territory that has a utility for conservation really holds in that in that way. That's great I think we'll leave that here for today and I it's sort of in my mind I've got talking oysters and parachuting beavers and I never thought I'd end a seminar like that so um, I just want to thank our speakers again uh, for their time and uh, I'll be in touch with you again just to uh, reiterate our thanks and thanks also to our um, online audience and to those of you in the room uh, please join us uh, again in expressing thanks to our speakers.